please stand with me as we are reading the word of God I will give you I will not take too much of your time like I said I'm always done before 3 p.m. I'm always done before 3 p.m. I'm always done I try my best I'm always done before 3 p.m. and I will continue to keep my record I will give you one principle this morning and this principle will go towards the fathers this message is not simply for the fathers but it's for every single young man who has not fathered yet this message is for every single mother or every woman who was about to get married or who are planning on getting married for you to know what the meaning of a father is I will give you a single principle because I want you to remember it because I believe this principle and this erroneous concept that we have of this principle is at the root of the problems that we are experiencing not only at school at home but in the church as well uh, we'll give you one single principle that we found that we can find in Proverbs chapter 22 verse 6 it is a very common word that is often used but often misunderstood Proverbs 22 verse 6 the word of God says so train somebody says train a child a child a child a child and the way he should go not in the ways notice the details and the way there is one single way somebody said this morning there is only one way I know society says that all the roads leads to Rome but that is a lie from the enemy there is only one way that lead to the kingdom of God a child and the way he should go and when he is old it doesn't only make reference to the boys but he's making reference to the young ladies also when he is old he will not he will not depart 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 the other version says turn from it which is to pivot from what was taught for what was given he will not turn from it please sit down Heavenly Father we come to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ father we give you praise we give you glory father for all the families father who have gathered here in this temple father seeking something from you father seeking something not from your hand but from your heart father let them hear from you this morning father I don't want to hear from my neighbor I don't want to hear from my besties I don't want to hear from my family members but I want to hear from Christ himself there is a single woman in this house father who's trying to get to the bottom of your garment father let her touch father the end of your garment father because there is deliverance in the garment that is wrapping Christ this morning there is a family father who's about to be divided father dad are about to go his way mom is about to go his way and the children are left alone father but I pray father for a spirit of communion father on this house father on the spirit of division father I come against this this morning father and I call for the peace of Christ peace of Christ among mom and dad and the children father and the family father we pray to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who shed his blood for us the eternal blood of Christ in Jesus name and let the house of Salem say Amen there is always some sense of comfort when you are starting a new job that you will find somebody to mentor you there is always a sense of comfort mostly when you're starting a new school I remember when I was a teenager and when I was about to start high school I was happy to know that my older cousin was was already in the school it brings you a sense of comfort it brings you a sense of confidence that no one else can give you but the state of mind knowing that you have somebody who has paved the way for you who has done the work for you and who can hold your hand and guide you through the difficult moment is there somebody says amen to that 
I believe that the spirit of mentorship is lacking in the church this morning. I believe that today too many pastors, evangelists, praise team leaders, or quote unquote apostle or prophet are calling out themselves without having been mentored or being called out by somebody else who was there before him. I believe that today in the church as we read through the Bible we have forgotten and we are misreading the Bible not knowing that you can't speak about Joshua without speaking of his mentor Moses. I believe this morning that you can't speak of Elisha without speaking of an eagle-eyed prophet named Elijah. I believe that today we preach so much about Timothy that we forget that Timothy had a mentor named Paul. A disciple, if you look for the word, a disciple is a follower who learns by observation. The disciple never stayed home. The disciple always stepped out of the house in order for them not to just speak about the discipline or their craft but to live it in person I believe that today we are liking we are lacking mentorship we are lacking discipleship not only in the house of God but in the school and in the house also itself from the beginning of the Bible if you read the Bible clearly you see that God is a person who pays close attention about how you duplicate yourself somebody says amen if God had given so many disciples to those great prophets and to those great women and men of God it's because God from the beginning had instilled in them the spirit of discipleship you can't be a pastor or a mentor or a, a, an evangelist and you don't have a disciple somebody who's following you somebody you training somebody you're trying to bring up because God from the beginning in Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 God says in the word so God created man and his own image I'm gonna duplicate you you're gonna be an image of me you're gonna be representing me not because you will have the same nose or the physical features no that's not what God was referring to God was referring to his character you will be compassionate you will be loving you will forgive you will know what to do when things get difficult and you will have wisdom those are some of the duplication that God was instilling in the man when God says that you will be created in my own image and he was not only speaking of the male but he was speaking about the female as well and then God gave them a simple order he told them to multiply so I am the beginning I'll duplicate you and then you will multiply yourself can I be carnal for a minute how many people love McDonald in this place don't lie to me Amen, 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 amen. How many people love Burger King? Oh, amen. How many people love Dunkin' Donuts? Uh, amen. This side is the Dunkin' Donuts lovers. Oh, God. Who else can I take? Who else can I trip? Who else can we Where can we go? Where can we go? Pizza Hut. Who loves Pizza Hut? He loves Pizza Domino's. Oh, good God. The thing with these companies, they have duplicated themselves. Whether you go to Miami and you go to Burger King, you expect the same burger to taste the same exactly as you ate it in West Palm Beach two days before. These companies understand that there is power and multiplications they understand that once we are duped once something works the first time and it's working it's functioning properly it's successful we are gonna duplicate it because we want it to be exactly the same you can't go to Miami and they are giving you a different type of flavor in the burgers you can't go to Port St. Lucie and think that the Domino's in Port St. Lucie is gonna taste differently than the Domino's in West Palm Beach because there is one thing in business when it works the first time we are gonna multiply it and we are gonna make sure it remains the same throughout the entire state 
entire country. Thank you, Pastor Lucy. So God says, listen to me. You are going to multiply and you are going to be exactly the same way that I have created you. Not be for the, from the physical aspect, that will come, but I want what I'm teaching you, what I'm giving you, for you to pass it down to your children. I believe that is the reason why Jesus himself had disciples, not because he needed them, but because Jesus believed in the power of multiplication. I want to acquaint you this morning with a very, uh, 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 a very crucial, let me use the proper word, very crucial principle and term, terminology or law in the Bible. It is the law of first mention. Whenever something is mentioned first in the Bible, it has a tendency 99% of the time or 100% of the time to keep the same meaning throughout the Bible. It is called the principle of the law of first mention. That whenever God says something from the beginning, he will not divert from it in the end. It is said from the beginning, it is the same throughout the Bible. So when God told the man that you will multiply in spirit, God says to every man that will come after him and to every evangelist and pastors and men that you will do the same. You will multiply my spirit through your children. So then God read, then we read in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, the Lord God took the man. Genesis 2, verse 15. Follow with me. I'm going somewhere with me, with you. The Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress. That's what the New King James Version says. The Lord took the man after he gave him life, after he made him in his own image, after he told them to multiply, then the God took him and said, put him in the garden to dress it. The word dress in the Bible means to cultivate. It means to, to, to keep it. It means to, to cultivate it, to, to help it grow properly. This instruction refers to discipline and order. So to dress means to cultivate. And to cultivate means to train. So let me go back to the first verse and let's read that verse properly. Instead of reading to train a child in the way he should go and when he's old he will not turn from it, let's read it the proper way. Cultivate a child in the way he should go and when he's old he will not turn from it. Because there is a difference between cultivating and letting something grow, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know if you've ever cultivated something, but when you let something grow, I don't care how good it is, it is considered as weed. Not the weed that people smoke, but weed like bad grass or whatever that we need to get rid of. It doesn't matter if you are planting strawberries, if you don't cultivate it, it will grow as a weed. And sometimes we misspoke about our children. We tell them that they are bad, but they were never cultivated. I don't care how resourceful and useful they are and how much fruit they produce, but because they were not properly cultivated, they are turning bad on our hand. It doesn't matter how much you, 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 you think the tree is fruitful. But if trees are not planted well, they become a forest. Amen. I know that's not what you wanted to hear this morning, but I'm going to preach it because that's what the word of God, that's what the spirit of God told me to tell you. That today we have many trees in the church. Today we have many, many weeds in the church because they were not cultivated. Amen. They are fruitful, they produce a lot, they have good jobs, they have houses, they have careers, but they are not properly cultivated. So therefore, when we look at them, we don't see cultivation, we see a forest. Or we see an unkept garden. And I believe that's the reason that God called Eden the garden of Eden because God was seeking cultivation, order, and discipline. I believe that today there is not enough cultivation in the church. 
I believe that today there is not enough cultivation in the house. I believe that today there is absolutely no cultivation in the school system. What society has done, it has left the cultivation to the mothers. I believe that today, because we think that mothers are more the ones who are the nurturers, which is unbiblical, we leave the discipline, which is the cultivation, because that's what discipline means in the Bible. It means cultivation. We have left it to the mothers. I believe today that one reason why children are so attached to their mothers is because the mother is the one cultivating the child. There is something in psychology that says that children, that children have something in them that they are seeking correction. They don't know it, but it's an in them. They seek correction. They don't, they, 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 they're not aware of it, but whenever they do something bad, they seek the correction of mom and dad. I believe that's, that's why today, punk pimps and drug dealers are so good with our children because they understand that there is power in cultivation. And they cultivate, they train, they correct our children in the ways that they want them to be. If you don't cultivate the child this morning, if you don't take the time to correct the child this morning, somebody else will do it for you. The enemy will do it for you because the enemy believes in the power of multiplication. In the book of Mark, we see that Christ, when the demon ex uh, uh, ex spoke to Christ, when they were inside of that man, they say we are called legion, which means that we march in order. We are together. We are disciplined. We, don't, we are not dysfunctional, but we walk in one step. The enemy himself understands that there is power and cultivation cultivate our children cultivate them so they can grow in the way of God and not depart from it the problem that arises from this is the word discipline can somebody say discipline Discipline is a word that is misunderstood by the church. The problem is whenever we talk about discipline, we have this erroneous understanding of the word. Discipline is not punishment, ladies and gentlemen. The Bible says in Ephesians 6 verse 4, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Exasperate means to push your children to the limit. Do not push your children either psychologically, physically, or emotionally, or spiritually to their limit. Do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the cultivation and instruction of the Lord. Discipline takes teaching. Yes. Discipline, let me say it again. Discipline takes teaching. Teaching takes your children to the next level. You cannot go to the next level if you are not taught properly. The church will never go to the next level or be more efficient if you are not taught properly. Discipline is teaching. It is one thing to teach a child, but correction will take the child to another level. It will shape the child. It will shape his character. Too many of our children are successful with our character. Too many of our children are successful with our character. I don't want you to be a doctor and all you do is stealing money from people. I don't want you to be an attorney and all you do is destroying people's lives. You could be a garbage man, but you have principles. Amen. I don't have any daughters, but I would hate to see one of our daughters here marrying a senator, marrying a president, marrying a governor, a man with no principles. It's pointless. It breaks my heart to see our daughters seeking a man with a resume in his hand. 
it breaks my heart. What are we teaching our children? To seek a resume or to seek character in a man? He looks good from the outside. He brings the money. But he slaps you every night. What is the point? What is the point? Too many of our sons lack character. The problem with the word discipline, because we think it is punishment, we assign it to the mothers. It is not punishment. It is teaching. The word discipline comes from the word, comes from the word disciple. The word discipline comes from the word disciple. So let's go back again on that verse because we're going to chew on this verse as much as we can. We're going to squeeze it. The first version, because that is the English version, train a child in the way he should go and when he's old he will not turn from it. But in reality it means to cultivate a child in the way he should go and when he's old he will not turn from it. But the root word of training and cultivating is discipline and the root word of discipline is disciple which this verse truly meant to disciple a child in the way he should go and when he's old he will not turn from it so the goal that God was giving the fathers is not to train is not to correct with their hands but to disciple the children and the way they should go and when they are old, they will not depart from it. Discipleship doesn't happen in the church. Discipleship does not happen in the church. Discipleship doesn't happen at 11 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. Discipleship happens every day. Discipleship happens at work. Discipleships happen when mom and dad don't get together. Discipleship happens when there's family crisis. A disciple is somebody who follows you wherever you go. So the Bible was basically telling the fathers that wherever you go, take your children with you. Because they've got to see you handling issues. If your children can't witness you, can't witness and see how you handle pressure, bad times, jobless, single, busted and disgusted, they will not disciple or they will not be disciplined. They've got to see you. They've got to witness it. I will not get into the details, but some men, a man, find his way to my child's ear, my son Samuel, and accuse me of something, accuse me of his demise and his life. Find a way to say that to my 11-year-old son and say that that's what your father did to me. But when your son is a true disciple of his father, my son said, there is no way my dad would have done this. Because my son knows me. Does your son and your daughters know you this morning? Do they know you? Have they seen you handling family crisis? Do they know their father's character? Adam knew his father's character. Peter knew Jesus' character. Elisha knew Elijah's character. David knew Saul's character. Do they know your character this morning? To say that my father will never do that, that's a lie in the name of Jesus. Your children, our children, they need to know who you are. Amen. The only way they will know who you are if you, if you spend time with them. Yes. You cannot disciple your children by living away from them. Amen. You cannot disciple your children by being at work all the time. Can I go further, Pastor K? Yes. You cannot disciple your children by being at church every day.
You don't have time for the children. You don't have time for the wife. But the last time I read the Bible, the Bible says that the church is the bride of God, of Jesus, not the bride of the Father. Leave the church alone. Only Christ can take care of it. Go home to your children and wife. Handle your business. Handle your business. Handle what God has placed in your hand to turn over to him. You cannot disciple your children long distance. You've got to spend time with them. You've got to give them something that they are seeking from every father, from every mother. It is not money. It is not a big house. It is not a new car. But it is your time. It is your time that they are seeking. We must disciple our children. We must disciple them to teach them, cultivate them. I want to give you a secret before I let you go. The secret of fatherhood, which is in the Bible. Like I said to you, I will not take too much of your time. We have a heavy schedule. But I want to make sure that you understand this clearly that it stays in your head i want to say to a father who's desperate this morning who thinks he cannot make it because he's not making enough money i want to talk to a father who may not have a career and then finds himself almost to the point of breaking point to the point of breaking because he's not or he thinks that he's not adequate for the family. I want to talk to a father who's alone maybe in this situation and is asking for help. I want to tell you that God is speaking to you this morning through his word. I want to talk to a mother who thinks that maybe, maybe I should have chosen another man to have these children with. And I'm going to tell you this morning, he is the perfect man for these children. He is the perfect man for you he is the perfect man for the household I want to talk to a man who made mistakes as a father who made mistakes as a husband I want to talk to a man who thought this was over for me there is no redemption for me in this situation the word of God says pastor Jackson if you could put it up for me this is the key to this message this is the key to your deliverance this morning to all the fathers let's go to Genesis chapter 18 chapter 18 verse 18 to 19 Genesis chapter 18 verse 18 to 19 if you want to highlight it in your Bible I will please I will gladly like to see you doing so if you want to memorize it I would love for you to do, to do that because this is the key Abraham the father of faith, the man that they call the father of faith, the man that many evangelist pastors admire because he was successful with God. The Bible says that God himself gave the key on why he was so successful. The word of God says, seeing that Abraham shall surely became, become a great and mighty nation. Abraham, Abraham the cheater. Abraham, Abraham the liar. Abraham cheated on his wife with his wife, green light, still, uh, uh, giving him the approval to sleep with the maid. Abraham the liar who lied to the Pharaoh and said that my wife is my sister because he was afraid. Abraham the imperfect man. God says about him, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation. Such an imperfect man. Father, husband. But yet God says, surely he will become a great and mighty nation. And all the nation of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him. I know him. How is it possible that God created the man, but God says, I know this man. What is about this man after all those mistakes 
And Aaron is with the family. That God himself says, I know this guy. I know this dude. I know him. For he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken to him. That is the key to successful family. That is the key to successful fatherhood. It is not about how much money you bring, ladies. It is not about how much money he brings in the house. It is not how big of a house he can buy for you. It is not about the type of car that he's driving. It is not about his resume. But it's only, only about teaching the children the way of the Lord. God is not asking anything else from the men. But I want you to teach them my way, the way of the Lord, for you to be successful. I believe that the greatest mistake that we ever made as fathers is to remove ourselves from the picture. We believe that taking care physically of our children and providing, with providing them with food and a shelter is enough. When yet we don't pray with our boys. But yet we don't pray with our daughters. But yet we don't teach them the verse and the meaning of the verse. But yet we don't decipher through their head and their mind after they leave school to see what they had learned. I believe today that the greatest mistake that you can make with your children is to refuse for them or not to encourage them to have some type of Bible study in their life. I believe that the greatest mistake that we can make with our children is to remove the word of God from schools. I believe the greatest mistake that family can always make is to say that the father cannot teach you never at church so you can teach my children the word of God. I believe the greatest mistake that we ever made is not to follow Abraham's example, to teach our entire household, whomever lives in your house, the word of God. In order for you to do that, you've got to give your children the greatest gift that you could ever give them. And this gift is yourself as a parent, as a father, as a mother. If Christ gave himself up for me why can't you give yourself up for your children that is the greatest gift that we could ever be given the gift of salvation from Jesus but in order for us to have attained, to have attained that he had to give himself up for us today I am giving myself up for my children I have to be lowered in order for them to rise. And I'm willing to give my entire self for the next generation because the God that we're serving is a God of generation. Enough of me and all for the next generation. May God bless you this morning.